It is good to be back. What's it been, five months since I've been here? <laughs> it seems like it. I have no place to be on Sunday until November 17, and I'll be in Mexico at that time. So between now and then, I'm going to be here. One of these guys may preach, but I'm going to be here. Didn't you love what God had to say through Gene a couple of weeks ago? I listened to that again this morning for the third time just because I enjoyed listening to him preach the Word. And uh, I, 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 just want, I just want you to know that. You've got great pastors. When I come back next week, we're talking about how you love on these guys who are your pastors. That's the text. Thank you for praying as I was in the revival this past week. Uh, at Clarksburg, the church was formed in 1823. It's out in the country, not a town around it, cemetery across the street from the church, been in existence, two families, two families, all of these years have made up that church. We've heard about family churches before, that was this church, but they wanted the Word preached to them to encourage them and revive them. So thank you for praying for that. This is how you can pray for me this week. Um, on Thursday, uh, I first meet a pastor from Sullivan, Missouri. He's going to drive to Jeff City to see me. He just baptized 15 two weeks ago uh, in the creek. It's called the Ridge Church, the Ridge in Sullivan, and Matt is his name, and so I'm going to get to hear his story. It is um, uh, Bob Caldwell and the Ridge Church uh, has, has replanted a church in Sullivan. They've replanted one in Gerald, Missouri. They've replanted one in Leslie, Missouri, so it's called the Ridge at Leslie, the Ridge at Sullivan, the Ridge at, and so they are taking these churches that are about to die and go under, and they're taking it over, and they're replanting this, and this in Sullivan has just really taken off. And so you can pray for Matt, the pastor there, because anytime God begins to do something, it's not far behind the enemy wants to come in and, and, and see that. So I'm going to see Matt at 9 o'clock. I have a meeting in Kansas City at 12 o'clock with a church planter and his wife. I have another meeting with somebody at 2 o'clock over security in the mission field around the world right now as far as getting security and securing him on retainer should any volunteer team be somewhere around the world. And in that process, chaos breaks out in the country where they are, and they need to be brought out and brought back home. And so Scott Brauner is that individual. Concilium is what he does, so pray for me with that. On Thursday evening, and this is just Thursday, and on Thursday evening I meet with, meet with 20 individuals out of one church, out of Emmaus Church in Kansas City, who feel called to missions internationally for their career, for their life. And so as an IMB missionary and as, as an IMB trustee uh, for, for missions, my goal is I'm praying that God will call 100 units out of Missouri to go serve somewhere around the world. A unit can be a single college student. It could be a single adult who's not a college student. It could be a married couple. It could be a married couple with eight children. But that's a unit. And I'm praying that God will call out 100 units, and all of a sudden I get this call from Emmaus Church, and they have 20 individuals in their church who are feeling called, sensing the call of God, the struggle to, we need to go. And so I get to walk them through the process of your international mission board so that they at least have that. Understanding there are about 750 mission sending agencies around the United States right now. All the others are, are faith raised. They must talk and pray in their resources to be able to go IMB because of your faithfulness in churches like you at giving through the cooperative program, the Lottie Moon, allows your IMB missionaries to go and they really are faith-raised because they're praying that you continue to give like they're doing and even increase that giving. So that's just this coming Thursday. So I really covet your prayers on Thursday. If you remember that, mark it down. Pray for Rick Hedger on Thursday morning. Take your copy of God's Word. Turn to 
uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, uh, the things that, that Gene shared with you at the end of chapter 4, uh, I, I told him I, I use the outline for that often, such a great grief, such a great grace, such a great gathering that there will be. Uh, you've heard me say before, uh, even though there, there are some who, who are in different places, and Gene did such a good job with, with talking about uh, the word, the Latin word raptura, uh, which is translated the English word rapture. And so often individuals will take this text that this text is talking about the rapture of those who are believers, those who are alive and those who have already died and their body is in the grave and it decayed in the grave. And God comes back with the trumpet sound, Jesus does, and those things take place uh, with the, the shout of the archangel and, and the voice of the trumpet of God. And, and what happens is the dead in Christ will rise first. That is, that old decayed body somehow, whether it's in a grave here, whether it's in a sea, buried at sea, whether it was burned up in a fire, whether something happened, it was eaten by a wild animal. It doesn't matter how that individual died. God, who can do anything, right? Nothing's impossible with God. He brings that body back to what 1 Corinthians 15 talks about. And Gene does. He brings that body back to a perfect body like Jesus. The Scripture tells us we do not yet know what He will be like, but when we see Him, we will know Him, for we will be just like Him. When that takes place, the body that He gives every one of us at that resurrection And the body that it's transformed into from those who are believers at that moment that happens and their body is changed in the twinkling of eye, as 1 Corinthians 15 talks about, and 1 Thessalonians does. We will go. We will be with Jesus. There are many godly scholars who stand in different camps about the order of things. I was surprised to see that John MacArthur is a strong pre-trib rapture believer. Chuck Swindoll is. Warren Wiersbe is. John Stott is. There are strong, but there are strong followers of Jesus that are not. And and they have a, a different view. I believe that a rapture is going to take place, and I'm going to go. Whether I'm alive or whether I'm dead, I will go to be with him. Uh, That's what I believe. But if you have a different persuasion from Scripture, I I told Gene this morning, speculation is great. And his speculation is as good as my speculation, and Colton's speculation is as good as my speculation, as long as our speculation is based upon Scripture. That's what we're basing it on. Not a hope so, but, but here's in Scripture where I think it's going to happen this way. Sandy says to me, I hope you're right. Well, I hope so too. But if not, guess what? I'm going to be with him. Right? I am going to be with him for all of eternity. Not because I'm good, but because he is good. Not because I have any power over it, but because he does, and that's what he promised is going to take place. And so... so, In my belief system, that's the rapture that takes place. Caught up, going to be with him. Uh, In fact, Revelation chapter 19 is is one of the places I go to, to to look at that where the believers are brought up. It's the wedding feast. The bride has made herself ready, dressed in white raiment, white raiment, the righteous acts of their life, and they will be with him, and that wedding time will take place in heaven. Now, if that's a chronological thing, if it's not a chronological thing, it's going to happen with God. One day is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. I mean, when we talk about Scripture, we can stand in a place. The reality is we can be wrong, but what we do know is we will be with Him. As believers, it does not catch us unaware. We're not caught by surprise. Now, when's it going to happen? Nobody knows. 
except for God the Father. Look what, look what it says in Matthew, before I read in Thessalonians. This is Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. This is Jesus saying this to his disciples just before he goes celebrates the Passover, before he's going to be crucified. Verse 36 of chapter 24, Matthew, he says, But concerning that day and hour, the one where he has just been talking about uh, uh, the individuals, and he's going to go talk about it more, about the... The marriage feast taking place and the ten virgins, five with oil in the lamps, five without, five that were wise, five that were foolish. And, and the time came and, and the five that had oil were taken with them, the five without were not, oil being symbolic of the Holy Spirit. In, in that case, the marriage supper's gone, the five go, they try to buy some oil, they come back, they want in, and the Son of Man says, I do not know you. What that tells me is there is a deadline. Once he returns, that deadline is done. And so if you're considering giving your life to Christ, if he were to return, if that trumpet were to sound tonight, I'd give my life to Christ today. If you're thinking about it. No peer pressure. Just if you're thinking about it, trust Him with your life. The Scripture tells us this. Over in Acts, Jesus said this to His disciples when they were asking, chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. So in Matthew, Jesus said, no one knows but the Father, not the angels. The Son of Man doesn't even know that time. Jesus is saying, I don't even know when that time is going to be. The Father has fixed the date. At some point, the Father will turn to the Son and say, Son, go get your bride. And when He does, it'll all happen. What we know is as believers, it's going to happen. It's not going to catch us by surprise. It's not going to overtake us. We know it's going to happen. Now, we might be living at the time in a way of shame we just talked about. But you know what? Christ has taken that shame, hadn't he? God became that shame on the cross for me, for you. He became my sin. The Scripture says in Colossians that everyone who hangs on the tree is a shame. Jesus became the shame. When I go to Muslim countries who deal with shame and honor, they need to see that Jesus took all of their shame when He hung on the cross. It's not guilt innocent. It's not right or wrong. It's not the law. It's shame or honor. For someone from that worldview, that's how they need to perceive Salvation of what Christ did for them. For you and I, raised in the United States or raised in, in uh, Europe with a guilt, innocent worldview, that's why steps to peace with God. That's why uh, tracks that deal with that He has taken my sin. He has paid the penalty. For someone in a Muslim background, killing somebody is not a sin if you're restoring honor. If someone has turned away and you kill your uncle and you kill your brother's daughter because she had turned to Christ, that's bringing shame on the family. They can take that person's life and in their world view, it's not sin. They're restoring honor to the family. We look at that and think, how can that be? But it's world view. And we must understand that when we get ready to present the gospel to someone. Let's move to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You have it open there before you. Let's begin reading in verse 1 through verse 11 for this morning. Now, now concerning, and I want us to understand about that phrase, now concerning, uh, uh, de peri, it means he's changing the subject. He, he's been talking about this catching away of those who are believers, but now concerning, 
And he's going to talk about that time of terror and judgment that's going to come upon the earth. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You've heard that phrase, right? You've read it as you've been reading the Gospels. He's beginning to talk about that time when judgment is going to come on the face of the earth. Like a thief in the night. Verse 3, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of the faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Great passage of Scripture. In order to understand this, we are looking at end-time events from two perspectives. The believers were dealt with, this is you. If, If you've had somebody who's died in your family, who was a believer in Jesus, understanding that until Paul had come, they had not had the gospel. Paul came down to Thessalonica because he was chased out of of, uh, Macedonia. Because Because he was chased... He was chased out. He came south 105 miles to Thessalonica. He spent three Sabbath days, that is three Saturdays in a row, in the synagogue as a Jewish rabbi. He was allowed to teach as a Jewish rabbi, a visiting Jewish rabbi. He would take the Old Testament texts. He would read them. He'd talk about the life of Jesus. He would interweave them, overlap them, saying, could this be? Could this definitely be the Messiah that the Old Testament texts are talking about? And all of that was going on. And so many of these who were Jews after about three Sabbath days, three weeks, the others who didn't want to hear that basically ran them out. So they moved over to other places like Jason's house, and they would begin meeting in Jason's home. And some Gentiles would begin to believe, even though some Gentiles didn't, and a lot of the Jews did not. They rose up. They sought Paul out, they had to drive Paul out, and he went down to Berea. Philippi is what I meant a while ago. I knew it would come. So these are brand new believers, many of them who had been Jews, who what about the Old Testament? From the time they were five and they began to go to school, they would memorize The first five books at age five, at age 12, from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I mean, there's a book to memorize, right? Numbers and Deuteronomy, they would have that memorized and learn to ask questions about the text. Those who showed promise would be invited to enter in from 12 to 17, and they would begin to memorize the prophets, and the poetry. And they would begin to take that in and learn to ask more questions. Those who were really good at asking questions, some rabbi, like Colton, would say, follow me to them. He wanted them to be his student. They would sit at his feet. He would teach them how to ask questions of the text based on his understanding, and they would become his disciples. Others would be called out by Rabbi Gene, 
And, and he would call them to be his, and he might have a slightly different perspective, and he likes the questions asked a different way. And this would go on, and they would begin to follow the rabbi to learn more and eventually become a rabbi who could call out others to follow you. But at age 12, if you really weren't that promising, you were sent back home to learn the line of work from your father. So fishermen became fishermen, right? Tax collectors became tax collectors. At a, even if you got invited back to go to age 17, if no rabbi came up and called you at 17, you went back and learned the work of your father, and you became what he was. So my dad was a carpenter. I would have become a carpenter. I would have learned that trade and that skill. But then along comes Jesus, and he calls these people who are rejects from all the other rabbis, and he begins to say to them after talking to the Father, and Father telling him which ones, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. This process went on, and he even called Paul on the road to Damascus, knocked him off the if it was on a horse, knocked him down, blinded his eyes by the bright light. He began to ask, Lord, who are you? I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks, the Scripture says. The prick was that goad, that pointed stick that would come out behind the oxen. If they would get mad at who was running the plow, they'd kick back and they would get stuck by the prick. Meaning... Conviction was taking place from Stephen's stoning, from everyone else that he had gone through. The conviction was coming on, and Jesus was saying, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Salvation took place. God had called him. He says, I didn't go to the apostles. They didn't teach me. Jesus took him to Arabia. He went out. God, Jesus, taught him. He, as one born out of due season, he says became an apostle. And so here he is in Thessalonica. Now he's in Corinth. He's gone down to Berea, from Berea to Athens, Athens to Corinth. Silas and Timothy have come down to Corinth. He sends them back to check out on Thessalonica. They come back, give him word. Paul's writing letter one to Timothy to take back to them. They've had some questions about what's going to happen when my loved one who became a follower of Jesus has died. Are, are they just doomed? Is it lost? No. And so you heard the message that Gene gave to you. But then, then he comes back and they say, but, but what about all these things that Jesus had taught? Because when you go through the Gospel of Matthew, there were a lot of stories that he told talking about the end times, one is, two are working in the field, one is taken, one is left. Two are here, one is taken, and one is left. Woe to the one who is expecting during that time, flee for the mountains. Jesus was talking about that there would be a time when he would come back on planet earth and there would be chaos. When you read the book of Revelation, does it look like chaos? It, it so looks like chaos that the hard-heartedness of men, even when you get reading through verse chapter 6 through chapter 19 and 20 and 21, men even raise their fist in the air to God and curse Him when the demonic powers are taking place and the Antichrist is seated into place. These types of things. They want to know, when is that going to happen? Has that already started because of the Roman Empire? They, they were worrying about the times and the seasons. And the first thing he tells them is, even Jesus said, nobody knows the day and hour. Jesus said, I don't know that day and hour. That's a time and a season the Father has set for himself only. So any book you read that tries to tell you when is a farce. Don't go there. Just don't go there. The reality is, when I read Scripture, something's going to happen cataclysmic around the world. 
as he is saying. He said this in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse let me just read verse 9 and 10. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the... What's that word? Wrath to come. That somehow there's something called wrath that's going to take place on the earth. And Jesus is going to deliver them according to Paul, which is according to the Spirit of God. No Scripture is given by any one individual's interpretation, but spiritual men moved by the Spirit of God, Peter tells us, began to write. So here's what he says. If I were to go... Uh, let, me, let me look up in, in chapter 2. Um, For what is our hope or joy or crown, verse 19, or boasting before the Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory. He talks over and over about the wrath. So here in chapter 5, he begins, concerning the times, the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, different than the trumpet sound and the calling of the way, the day of the Lord, when he is bringing upon the face of the earth the punishment that Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah talk about going to take place. While people are saying there is peace and security, that is, while they're thinking, man, everything's going great. Everything is wonderful. My checking account is good. My job is good. While, while individuals who are not saved are saying everything in the world seems to be on the up, the stock market is going up, everything seems to be going good, my life is at peace, it doesn't seem to be bad. He's just saying when people are in that type of place, when they're saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon the pregnant woman. He uses the two illustrations of a thief in the night. What's the thing about a thief in the night? Is anybody sitting up waiting for a thief to come at night? No, because you're sleeping. He says, those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Those who sleep, sleep at night. But we're of the day, we're not of the night. The reality is... I never known of a thief announcing, oh, I'm going to come to your house tonight and steal from you. There's no announcement of the time and when that's going to take place. But the reality of a thief at night is very real. In other words, it's unannounced. Now, what we know about pregnancy, once somebody knows their pregnancy... There is going to be a day when birth pains begin. It's unavoidable. If they're going to go through and deliver. Now, we live in a day and a time when medical science has worked things to where you might be able to escape some of it. But for Jesus' day, the birth pains and delivering babies with no anesthetic whatsoever was painful and it could be deadly. And he uses these illustrations to say it's unavoidable, it's unannounced. This time when the judgment of God is going to come upon the world, when everything that you start in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation through the end of chapter 19 and 20, all of that judgment, all the bowls of wrath, all the trumpets that are blown, when you read that, that is going to happen. You don't know when, but it's unavoidable. If you are not a follower of Christ, it's not announced but it's unavoidable. You will go through it. If my speculation is correct, and Jesus comes in that trumpet sound, and I am changed 
in the twinkling of an eye, and I go to be with him. I'll have the beam of judgment seat where the Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, our works will be judged as wood, haste, double, gold, silver, precious stone. Some individual will be saved, yet so as by the skin of their teeth, so as by fire, the Scripture says. There's a period of time that we're not really told about what's happening other than she's made herself the bride. She's made herself ready. And chapter 19 is the wedding ceremony. During that time... Here's what, here's, what's, here's what would happen. When you get into 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 2, you're going to talk about the man of lawlessness who's been withheld right now. The day's going to come when it's going to be revealed, whoever this man of lawlessness is. Somehow, if there's a rapture of all believers out, there's utter chaos around the world. The Jews who are not believers, are still there. And the Muslims, who are not believers, are still there. The Scripture talks about the temple is going to have to somehow be rebuilt because it's not there right now. But Israel, right now, Israel, my glory, talks about how they have all the breastplate, they have all the things, they have everything in place to rebuild the temple. They're even saying where the Dome of the Rock is, it's sitting not on where the Holy of Holies was, but in what was the court of the Gentiles. And Israel knows where the stone is, where the Holy of Holies was. And what if a public figure, Antichrist, could come on the scene and work out a deal between Jews and Muslims to rebuild the temple? And the sacrifices begin again. And three and a half years into a seven-year horrible tribulation time, this Antichrist turns and goes into the holy holies and sits on the throne and says, I'm God. What if? And utter chaos takes place the last three and a half years, according to the Revelation. And that's when those who become believers, because of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, who are sent out around the globe, sealed in their forehead by the Spirit to where what the Antichrist does cannot bother them, sharing the gospel, people coming to faith in Christ, individuals paying for their belief with their very life as martyrs, starvation because they can't buy or they can't sell. Revelation chapter 7 says, Who... Is this multitude of those in white garment raising the palm branches and praising God night and day? Who are they? John? John says, I don't know. You know. He says, These are those who've come out of the great tribulation. And they've washed their robes white through the blood of the Lamb. What if? That's really the way it's going to come down. What if? And that's what I believe. It will. And at the end, Jesus comes back because the Father says, now is the time. And on his thigh is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's riding the stallion, so to speak, with the picture of what they had with the Roman soldiers. It's the only way they could describe it. And his armies behind him of the angels. And he speaks the word. And he takes the false prophet and the beast and casts them in the lake of fire. And he takes the false prophet. He, he, takes, he takes the Antichrist and puts our Satan and puts him in the pit for thousand years? Uh, that, that's what the text says. 
and he's bound for 1,000 years, and Jesus sits on the throne on earth for 1,000 years. And like in the days of Noah, people are marrying and given in marriage, having children, and Christ is ruling on earth with a scepter of iron. But at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released. And he gathers the kings of the world and he comes and rebels. And Jesus comes again and with the sword of his mouth, his word, he simply speaks. And they are all destroyed. Then you have chapter 20. You have the great white throne judgment. What, what if? I don't have to go through it all and tell you. Read it. What if that is exactly how it's going to happen in apocalyptic literature? Is it symbolism? Is it going to happen that way? I say again, like Jean, godly men have stood in different positions. Godly men. Godly theologians. Godly pastors have stood in separate places. The reality is this. I want to be with Jesus. Right? I want to be with Jesus. And the only way to be with Jesus is the fact that at some point in my life, while I'm still breathing on planet Earth, conviction comes over my life about my sin and my guilt. And I'm broken for that. The scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, godly sorrow is not sorrow that needs to be repented of. Godly sorrow that comes because of my sin, because all of a sudden I realize my sin has hung Jesus on the cross. When he hung on that cross, stretched out arms and said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And all of a sudden I come to realize that that's me. That's me. For me it was the second Tuesday night in January of 1978. Come to realize. Religious beforehand. Knew a lot of the answers. Even been out on visitation. But not a believer myself. Second Tuesday night of, 19, of January, 1978, January 10th. When I cried out to God to forgive me of my sin and come into my life and change my life and make my life count for Him to be my Lord and my Savior. He forgave me of my sin. Past, present, and future. He says in the Old Testament, He will never Remember my sins again. That means he will never, in the Hebrew, he will never hold up. Say, Rick, remember. Remember, Rick. He will never do that. In fact, in Jude, verse 24 and 25, it says, He's going to present me before his Father in heaven with great joy. I'm thinking, how in the world? I know me. How in the world could he present me before his Father in heaven with great joy? But Jude writes, that's what Jesus is going to do for those who have trusted Christ as their Savior and Lord. Have you? Have you? If not, why not today? If the conviction is there and you know that you have sinned against God, I'm convinced about this. We don't have to tell somebody they're a sinner. They know. They know. So mama in Africa dancing around after I told her the whole story with tears running down her face, and I put my arms around her and stopped her and said, why are you so excited? She said, you just told me the most wonderful news in all the world that God has forgiven me of my sin. Why wouldn't I be excited? I didn't tell her one thing about her sin. It's the Spirit of God did. And she knew. She prayed. 
she trusted Christ. Or the other woman with the knife and her stool and sits it down in front of Sandy and before the fire cuts off the fetish around her wrist and her waist and throws in the fire and says, I choose to follow Jesus. She knew her sin. She knew she needed a Savior. And two weeks later, she had died. You know. You know. I may not know you. You do. And you don't even know yourself, really. But Jesus knows every word you've ever said, every thought you've ever thunk. Is thunk a word? Every thought you've ever had, every act you've ever imagined or have ever done. And he went to the cross for you.